thank you everybody for joining us, whether you're joining us live or joining us uh, post webinar. This is uh, our webinar on our top scholarships for international exchange, study abroad, uh, academic exchange. This webinar is presented uh, by the National Clearinghouse on Disability and Exchange, which is a project sponsored by the US Department of State's Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, designed to increase the participation of people with disabilities in international exchange between the United States and other countries. And it is supported in its implementation by my employer, uh, Mobility International USA. We're co-presenting this with Vicki Johnson of ProFellow and you're going to hear more about that in a short bit. Just a few um, housekeeping uh, requests. Uh, first of all, uh, Monica is helping me to make sure that all the uh, technical details are functioning, the recording, the chat box. You can access a link to the captions in the chat box. The link has also been emailed to you if you signed up for the webinar earlier. And uh, if you have a question, you feel free to chat it to us through the chat box. Um, and Apart from that, please mute your yourselves when you come in. Uh, and uh, with that, I think that we can go ahead and uh, get started. And so I'm, I've got the slideshow here, Vicki. So uh, you just go ahead and say next slide. Um, okay. I'm sliding, oh, and I'm trying to reassert control over the slideshow now. And because uh, my key is not working. Okay, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna hand it off now to Vicki uh, of ProFellow. Thank you so much, Vicki. Okay, and you said I can do the slides or you're doing them? Oh, you, oh I'm, I've got them here. Okay. So just say next slide. Thanks. Um, yes, well, thank you so much for having me to talk about fellowships, funding awards, grants for individuals, especially to go abroad. This is a topic near and dear to my heart. So just a little background about me. Uh, my name's Vicki. I'm the founder and director of ProFellow.com, and I myself, I'm a four-time fellow, and part of the reason I got into the world of uh, fellowships and um, study abroad is just because I really enjoyed my study abroad experience when I was an undergrad, and um, so I started looking into opportunities and ways to go abroad again when I was a professional. And I discovered that um, some of these funding awards are, are one of the very few ways that you can go and have an international experience. So in my background, I did a uh, New York City Urban Fellowship right after my um, undergrad. Uh, after that, I did a German Chancellor Fellowship in Germany, and I was there for about a year and a half and had the chance to work on a self-designed project. I did the um, Herbert Scoville Jr. Peace Fellowship in Washington, DC. And then uh, kind of later, I did the, um, a Fulbright Award for mid-career professionals called the Ian Axford Fellowship in Public Policy in New Zealand. And I even stayed and did my PhD in New Zealand. So um, I actually founded the site when I was a PhD student because I wanted to help more people find these funding opportunities because back in the day, especially when the internet wasn't what it is today, it was very hard to find these uh, awards. It was very much word of mouth. Um, it was kind of just like this mysterious thing. And I was always doing really deep internet research <laughs> to find them. And so um, the, the idea of the site was to create this um, go-to source of information on funding awards. So if you go to profello.com, we have a free database of more than 1300 awards um, that re we call them fellowships, but essentially they uh, cover all sorts of things. Um, so there's some for professional pursuits. There are some for academic study and uh, uh, research pursuits. So all sorts of things. It's people at all ages, all disciplines, um, education levels, citizenships, um, you name it. So I would just encourage you to come to the site and check it out. It's totally free to join. And we have a newsletter where we share new opportunities as they, they come into our pipeline. Um, so next slide. So um, what I talk about a lot, since I have a lot of experience myself um, applying and winning these awards, I often give talks about how to create a really strong application for the awards. And this is just something I've, um, I've sort of garnered from my own experience, but I've also interviewed thousands of award winners over the years for articles on Profello and for part of our content. And there's certain themes that I just noticed that came up. So things that I was sort of doing in my application, I realized that other other winners were doing them as well. So over the years, I found some really unique ways to strengthen your application. Um, so I'm gonna tell you today uh, the five secrets of fellowship winners. 
Um, and actually, I don't know if I have a slide on this, go to the next slide. Um, but I just want to mention first that uh, a lot of these applications are much like applying to say a graduate school. So you're doing, um, you're doing a personal statement. Sometimes you have to do a project or research proposal, references, um, you know, short answer responses, resume or CV. It's a pretty intense application. It's not like applying to a job. So um, that's one thing. So these um, application secrets, if, since you've, if you've applied to college or graduate school, you'll be familiar with that type of application. So um, from that point, it's like, well, how do I create a really strong personal statement? How do I create a really strong project proposal? So my number one thing that I tell folks about these awards, whether they're called fellowships, scholarships, grants, whatever you name it, the number one thing you need to do is align your goals. So it's not really about your personal goals, it's really about the fellowship organization's goals. So every funding body has a broader social impact mission. They um, are using funding as a way to invest in people to further some broader goal. So in some cases, fellowships are about um, creating diversity in, a new, in an industry. Sometimes it's about, you know, combat, combating a social issue like poverty or education or climate change. Um, sometimes it's just about, you know, strengthening um, relations among countries. So always, it's really important to try to figure out what is the organization's mission? Why are they investing this money in people? And you can do that by looking at, uh, obviously, number one, look at the website carefully, look into what the, they say is their mission, what are their values. You can also look at what previously uh, has been funded. So what kind of projects are they funding? What types of people are they funding? That'll give you a sense of what their mission is. Um, and you can even look at what they brag about. So when they talk about the impact or the outcomes of their program, what are the things that they brag about? So for example, when um, I was applying for the New York City Urban Fellows Program, they, they actually at that time didn't have much information on their website, but I heard them bragging about 80% of our fellows go on to work in city government. And I thought, oh, okay, that's, that's the mission. They want people who are gonna work, recent graduates who are gonna go and commit and work in city government. So um, I wish should mention for, uh, like, for awards like the Fulbright program, a lot of people miss the mark um, because they don't understand the mission of the Fulbright. So Fulbright will fund, and actually he'll be talking a lot more about this later, Fulbright will fund uh, research projects, study abroad experiences, uh, creative projects. Um, and so sometimes people think it's about funding the project. It's actually not. The purpose of the Fulbright Award, their goal is to create international ties between the US and other countries. So when you are writing your application, you really have to touch on that mission. So how is your being in this foreign country, how is your project gonna help further the mission of strengthening the ties between the US and that host country? Um, and if you miss that mark, it, you will actually have, uh, your application will, will not do as well. So keep that in mind, always look for the, um, the mission. Next slide. Now, the next thing I tell folks is, um, especially when you have a project proposal, um, you really want to go niche. Um, often these awards are anywhere from a few months to maybe a year, at most two years in length. So it's a short amount of time. So especially if you have to do, if you're doing a project or research proposal, I say propose a narrow research topic um, or do something that is, um, has a pretty, like a really, uh, fo a very clear focus. Because when you have a really broad research topic, it often can raise questions about the feasibility of your project or sort of, you know, what's the purpose of this. But if you have a really specific niche topic that you're going to work on during your fellowship, um, the more um, viable and feasible it will appear and it also can be more memorable. So for example, um, I was mentioning when I did my Ian Axford Fellowship in New Zealand, I was generally interested in this topic of children and disasters. New Zealand is a very disaster prone country. And I could have done broadly a topic like, how do schools prepare for disasters? But it's only a seven month fellowship. And so what I did is I really narrowed it down to something really specific. And I looked at the one curriculum program on disaster preparedness and how the schools uptake and use of that program. And I didn't make it this big, broad, wide topic. So it's, that made it more memorable and more viable. And also the narrow focus instills confidence that you um, know what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do it, and um, how that project is gonna help you achieve your kind of broader goals. 
Now for, for programs that don't have a project or research proposal, it might just be a professional fellowship that's sort of like a full-time job for, that, for those couple months or that year. Um, I also say to, you, you should have a really clear career goal. What is, the, what is the two to five year career goal that you're gonna do after the program? Um, that career goal helps you to create a story about wh how that fellowship fits in with your kind of story. So if you don't have a very clear career goal, they don't really see what's, why do you need this fellowship? Why do you need to go and have this experience now? But if you can tell them, you know, um, I'm having a, an international experience because I want to get language and cultural skills that I'm going to use um, in my graduate, uh, my graduate research, or I want to be a stronger candidate for graduates for this one of these graduate programs that has an international focus, then it's like, oh, okay, I can, I can see now why this funding award is really important for you at this time. Um, so that's another thing. So have a really clear career goal. And for many of you that have multiple career goals or you don't want, know what you want to do, don't worry. Most of us, I still don't know what I <laughs> want to do with my life. Um, it's okay. I just say pick one. Pick one authentic goal and go with that and say that will be, um, that will be your goal. Okay, next. My next, um, my next, uh, uh, my next slide is about adding urgency to your application. So you want to explain why you need to do the fellowship right now. So um, this is another way to give your application a little bit of an edge over other candidates. Um, so if you think about um, when they're looking at two equally qualified candidates. Um, if one says, you know, I really need to do this in this time period for this kind of urgent reason, um, they might have a little bit of an edge over a candidate who, you know, could do that fellowship the following year, two years from now, or doesn't really have any really strong reason why they need, need to do it right now. So a couple ways that you can add urgency, especially if you're open-minded about what your project might be, study, you could study a fleeting phenomenon. So, you know, in my field, I, I worked in the field of emergency management disasters for a long time and disasters are, are kind of one of those things that um, there's many kind of what I call fleeting phenomena around that. So you might look at the impact of a recent disaster on a community because that's only going to happen in that time period. Um, you could look at um, how a piece of legislation is uh, unfolding. You could look at uh, the impact of climate change on a community. You could look at, there's any number of things where at this point of time, it's going to be different now than it is in a year from now, two years from now. So that's one thing you can do if you're sort of open to topics and you're looking to say, oh, what should I do? What should I study on this? Um, other things you can add are, you know, looking to see what kind of conferences, conferences and events are going to be happening in the fellowship location during the fellowship period that you can sort of tie into your application. So if there's an international conference of experts in your field that will be, you know, let's say you're going to Germany, it's going to be in Germany during the year of the fellowship, you should tie in that to your application and mention that this is, um, I mean, this not only strengthens the, the depth of your project, but um, will give you an element of urgency. Also for many people, like they'll say that this international experience can help prepare you for graduate school. So if you plan to study an international topic of any sort in graduate school, the language skills, the cultural immersion, um, even some of the expertise that you might gain during the fellowship um, will make you a stronger candidate for graduate school. So um, that's something to mention, you know, so don't leave that out of your application. That's a little bit of urgency. Next slide. The num now, the next thing I talk about is speaking with former fellows. So one thing I've noticed um, in speaking with thousands of fellows is that a key difference between people who were successful and people who were rejected is that winners spoke to former fellows during the application process. So th th there's nobody else that will know better about the application, the mission of the program, uh, the people who are making the decisions, and even things like the interview process other than the people who have been through it themselves. So no, no matter how, what you can get great mentorship from professors and others, but really the fellows can give you those insights, especially recent fellows. So it's really useful to speak to fellows during the application process and um, have really you know, prepared questions for them. Um, one way that you can get introductions to former fellows is one, a lot of these programs will have ambassadors. So you can just write to the fellowship staff and say, do you have fellows who are ambassadors that I could speak to about the program? Um, if for any reason they, they don't have that or they're not able to facilitate that, 
you still might get brownie points for just asking, but you can also easily find many of these folks online. So you can go into LinkedIn, do an advanced search to see maybe you're connected to somebody, someone like me, who's connected to fellows and um, use that as a way to get introductions. You can also talk to your university because they may know of alumni that have done the fellowship that you can speak with. Um, sometimes fellows, you can just see who were the fellows in the last cohort and look them up and, you know, often you can find people's email addresses and things online. So I think it's good as, as best you can is to get an intro to the person. So you're not kind of cold emailing, but in any case, even if you were cold emailing, I mean, fellows are very open to talking about the fellowship. And in fact, many of them are eager to talk about it and to give their advice. So when you get those conversations set up, be prepared with questions about, you know, what are, what do you think they're looking for in candidates? What do you think made your application stand out? Um, what was the interview like? What should I what kind of questions did they ask? These are really, really good insider tips that you can't get elsewhere. Next slide. Um, the next thing is just to be prepared. So uh, the other thing about successful candidates is they do a lot of preparation for these applications. They don't take them lightly. And uh, so you prepare a lot during the application, during your research into you know, the, your project proposal and your hosts and, and that sort of thing. But even during the interview, um, don't take the interview lightly too. If you get to the interview stage, number one, congratulate yourself because it's a big deal even just to get to the finalist stage for a lot of these awards. Um, but, you know, prepare, practice your pitch, as I call it. So a lot of these uh, fellowships and programs will even, uh, they do their interviews even like in group settings. So you might meet the other candidates. Um, you might be doing like a panel interview where it's you speaking to a panel, but you're going to be asked a million times, oh, who are you? What's your, what's your background? What's your project? Um, so kind of be prepared to be well-spoken about what you're doing, why you're doing the fellowship, um, what your project is. It might take a little bit of practice um, because especially if you're working in a technical or scientific field, you know, you want to talk about your project in layman's terms because people on the selection committee may or may not have the same, you know, scientific background. Um, and you want to be able to just show a lot of enthusiasm and confidence in your project. So practice it. Also, you know, make sure you talk about your specific career goal. You can uh, hone that in again. And then also be prepared to discuss um, how you accomplish things, not just what you accomplish. So when they ask you about um, situational uh, things like, you know, what, what, what's a leadership, uh, give us an example of one of your leadership projects or things. You don't want to just say what you did. Oh, I, I led a team of 20 or I, um, you know, I created this report. You want to talk about how you did it. So if, even if you say you managed people, is there a particular approach to how you managed people? Did you, um, invest time and effort into professional development for the team that you managed? Are there things about that that you can mention about how you did it? Same for um, even research projects. How did you do your research? Did you use a new research method? Um, did you have a unique approach to your research? You know, always think about the how because the details, those are the things that people remember from those interviews. So don't be vague. Next question. I mean, next slide. <laughs> Okay, so those are kind of my top five tips. And so, you know, be sure to go to profellow.com. You can sign up, get into the database, get on our mailing list. We also do application and career courses. We have lots of, I mean, even if you can't meet a fellow, we've got lots of interviews with fellows who give their application tips. So we're just the place that you can find all the support that you need to apply to these very competitive awards. Um, so I think we're doing questions at the end, correct? So we can move on to the next. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Vicki. Yeah, I, I'm not hearing any questions so far, but if anybody has any, uh, welcome to ask at any point during the presentation. Thank you. And just kind of as a note uh, for anybody who might be accessing this webinar, um, we first discovered ProFellow probably about six months to a year ago. I think uh, each of us on the team kind of discovered it at different points in time. So um, that's, but, but it's, it's an amazing resource when you, whenever we look about, uh, look up like how to select a graduate school or how to identify a PhD program. It seems like at least I know for me, I, I often find ProFellow and the top results and, and the resource, the advice they offer is um, very sustentive and helpful. So, um, I mean, not just, you know, Vicki's not just got a lot of great tips on, oh, on yeah. scholarships, but also on graduate school and a lot of other excellent exactly. areas. 
I just want to mention all of our content is written by former fellows. So it's not, you know, just random art, you know, authors. It is really all written by former fellows who want to pay it forward. Yeah. Is there like a newsletter too people can get on to be advised about like uh, when new fellowships come out and things like that, mm -hmm. Vicki? You can sign up. There's all sorts of pop-ups and subscribe buttons on our yeah. site. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, and I'm on that list. It's great. Uh, I, I love it. So, um, and uh, you know, we have in at our website too, we have some scholarships and um, they, uh, it's, it's a non-exhaustive list. I, I think the purpose of this presentation going on to my part is just kind of looking at just thinking about the possibilities. This is a, a sample of some of the opportunities that are out there, uh, mostly for US students though, uh, there are um, some opportunities also for inbound students as well and uh, probably quite a lot more over at Profellow. Um, and I, all of these are, you know, we, we, they're very quick summaries that we have here. And what I recommend is that you um, go take a look at the original website. And also like Vicki said, go talk to former fellows or former winners of these programs to learn about the fine details because um, what we have here is just kind of a very broad overview. Uh, and so kind of getting into my presentation here to start, we have uh, scholarships and fellowships uh, from the um, department from the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs of the Department of State, that is to say our funder. Um, the first one is uh, the Benjamin A. Gilman Award from the Department of State. Uh, Benjamin A. Gilman Award, probably in terms of like, uh, it's, for grad it's for undergraduate students for the most part. Um, programs as short as two weeks, if you're going to a community college up to uh, a year, awards of uh, up to uh, Monica, you, you can see the slide. It's it's like about $8,000. Is that right? Um, correct. Yeah, you yes. have up to $8,000 for studying in um, a critical need language. Oh, for the, the Gilman? Correct. Oh, great. Yes, for a critical language, but then $5,000 for everything else. So as, as, uh, as, um, as Vicki mentioned, you know, you've got to focus on the mission of uh, what you're looking at, what you're applying for. Department of State wants to create um, interaction between U.S. citizens and citizens of other countries and um, the purpose of the Gilman is to make sure that they uh, can that uh, we're sending diverse Americans abroad so um, definitely people who have Pell Grant uh, benefits uh, are more going to be more competitive people also from underrepresented backgrounds uh, disability is considered an underrepresented background so that's something to consider and uh, there are a couple application cycles so um, kind of based on your program, you'll want to check their website uh, to identify the cycle that corresponds with the program that you're thinking about. Uh, Gilman uh, does not have a specific program attached to it. And you're going to see kind of what I mean about that. You're going to, uh, it's going to fund you to do a program from your, uh, from your college. Um, in contrast, uh, Fulbright, like Vicki mentioned, Fulbright is an academic exchange. It's in its very wide range of different kinds of things you can do. It's not just they give you funding and you go do uh, whatever program you find. It's it's a program in itself, and uh, you can. There's a scholar award. There's a student award. Um, there's also a Fulbright Foreign Student Award, so uh, to even uh, students from other countries to come to the United States. And uh, you're you're basically gonna you're submitting a proposal and um, telling them the kind of degree or the kind of research that you want to do and how that's going to fit in with the United with the Department of State's mission to create more uh, citizen diplomats, more um, interaction between the United States and other countries and, and more understanding. Uh, and the programs are almost fully funded. It's it's uh, most many of most of your programmatic expenses are uh, covered, uh, but coverage does vary from Fulbright to Fulbright and depending on the country in the program. Uh, and so actually, um, I should tell you, we're actually coming up to Fulbright season, especially for US students. Check their website at the end of March because I, that is when the application deadline is opening and we will be announcing that. Uh, and speaking of uh, another program here, the Kennedy Luger Youth Exchange and Study Yes program. This is for actually for high schoolers. Um, we often host a group of disabled students from predominantly Muslim countries. They come, this is, the, that's the other direction. Students from other countries come to the U.S. But this is the um, outbound version of Yes for U.S. students. And uh, it covers 
most of the oh, most of your costs for spending a year abroad in a predominantly Muslim country and it's something that we would like to see more high school students with disabilities considering and uh, the applications open in the fall and they come closed in December again we'll let you know when that happens and uh, Congress Bundestag uh, also sponsored by Department of State. This is also, these, these are awards for st uh, various different scholarships offered for study in Germany. And so students uh, wishing to go study in Germany, I believe all the way down to high school, uh, there are opportunities to uh, take coursework in Germany. And surprisingly for some of these programs, you'd think you'd need to speak German, uh, you better check the requirements because that may actually not be a requirement. You just have to be interested in German in order to interested in Germany in order to uh, qualify for this award. And uh, applications open in fall again due in December. Critical and the critical language scholarship program. Now this is unlike Gilman and uh, kind of more like the more recent uh, awards. This is also a program. Um, the goal of this, it kind of like you, we mentioned earlier, Gilman gives you more $8,000, up to 8,000 to study a critical language, 5,000 for other programs. The Department of State is very interested in having more Americans learn a critical languages. And you can go to the Department of State or the Department of Defense webpage to find the list of critical languages, which includes such examples as uh, Russian, as uh, Arabic, um, a lot, uh, a lot of different languages. And uh, you can go to the CLS website and check uh, the different base, the region and uh, the different program offerings. And it looks like I was just visiting it before this presentation. You essentially apply uh, directly to the program. And again, the experiences are, they fund most uh, of, of your costs. And uh, it, it's for students in college, you have to be a high school graduate. Uh, however, in high school, you might still wanna study a uh, critical language and uh, Oh, and by the way, the application opens in September and is due in November. But if you're in high school and aren't eligible for CLS, uh, you can apply for the National Security Language Initiative for Youth, or NSLIY, which uh, my analysis of this, it's, it sounds kind of like the CLS, uh, except it's, it's for high schoolers. Um, a lot of more summer opportunities. And again, uh, program offerings specifically uh, very specific programs that you would apply to and they, they cover nearly all of your costs to study a critical language. And uh, again, uh, check the requirements too for any sort of proficiency before, uh, but it's likely to that most of these, they want to get you interested in the language. And so as a result, you don't need to have necessarily proficiency in the language. You just have to want to study it. Um, and application opens in the fall and comes due at the end of October. Uh, of course, scholarships from Department of State aren't the only ones. There's also scholarships from other organizations. Uh, to start with, the Department of Defense offers the David L. Boren Award and also the David L. Boren, uh, David L. Boren Scholarship and Fellowship. The, the scholarship is um, for undergraduates. It funds um, up to a year, up to $20,000 to spend up to a year, a semester to a year uh, in another country studying, again, studying a critical language. Uh, the BORN, again, is for uh, students who want to study critical languages. Uh, in the case of the scholarship, that is undergraduate students. And, um, and this is kind of interesting. So they have uh, flagship programs. So check your college if they actually have one of these flagship programs. Uh, because those programs, it looks like they have a slightly different uh, rule as far as enrolling uh, and applying to the Born Pro Award. But don't be discouraged if you don't have one of those at your campus, because most of the people who get into the Born will do so. Uh, uh, oh, uh, somebody just came on. If you could please mute your microphone. Thanks. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for joining us too. Um, so, where was I? So the uh, so Boren is is uh, for for undergraduates studying critical language, uh, and um, yeah, don't be discouraged if you don't have one of the uh, language flagship programs at your college, because most people who get on the Boren will do so through another program. So they actually have a separate page uh, where they discuss the requirements for programs that are not affiliated with those uh, particular flagship programs, and. Um, it's a great opportunity. Um, 
a lot of people learn Spanish kind of a side tip. Spanish does not qualify, but uh, Portuguese does. So um, if you're like me, you know, that, that's, that's a, that could be a way to expand your language skills and, uh, and get into this program. So applications opening in the fall and, and uh, coming due near the end of the year. And, the, and of course the David Boren Fellowship. And this is essentially for students that are in graduate programs. So kind of similar goal, basically a similar concept as the scholarship, but it's essentially if, you've, if you're in grad school, you should look into the fellowship. Uh, if you're interested in studying a critical critical need language. And, uh, and it's also a slightly bigger awards too, up to $24,000 versus up to $20,000. Uh, on our website, we say up to $30,000. And uh, that is if you feel that there is a particular reason why you would actually need more than the official $24,000 limit, uh, it sounds like there is a, maybe a little extra um, extra uh, proposing that you would have to do. Uh, so you, you'd want to consult with with Oren to uh, identify what, what, what they're kind of looking for in order to toss in that extra $6,000. So the Fund for Education Abroad is uh, kind of going back now to just the scholarships. This is not an exchange program. This will sponsor you to do an exchange program at your college. And the goal is to primarily to support students from underrepresented diverse backgrounds. Uh, students of color, uh, LGBTQ students, first generation students and community college students have particular preference on this scholarship. Uh, also students from um, historically black or uh, otherwise kind of minority serving uh, colleges uh, also kind of get also get a preference for this for this award. Uh, we still encourage you to if you have a disability mention it on the application that can I know when I've when I've been a reader for this I know I'll try to try to nudge folks like that forward um, but um, there, there's not a specific preference for that, but thank goodness too, we come with m multiple identities. So think about, uh, are you first generation? You know, are you a student of color? Or do you meet one of the other um, groups that FEA is trying to support to study abroad and, um, and consider applying for them because it's a great, it's a great opportunity and uh, awards up to $10,000. So, um, so that that's definitely a compelling opportunity. They have, they have an app, they actually have a few different cycles. So I've got one here, it opens in December and comes due uh, in the spring. Uh, I believe there's actually another cycle that opens up in the fall. So um, keep an eye on our website. Keep an eye also, I think all of these organizations too, they have newsletters. So if there's one in particular that you're interested in that you think you'll wanna get, get on their newsletter because then they'll let you know that that's actually often how we find out about these things in addition to getting on Profello. And uh, Peace Corps, this is another very unique one. So you have to have a Bachelor of Arts uh, degree you have to have graduated college. And Peace Corps is essentially, it's an experiential opportunity. You go around anywhere, uh, anywhere, any one of the countries where Peace Corps is trying, any, uh, any one of those, uh, Let's see, uh, you go to the Peace Corps website and you can see the countries where they're trying to send people. And so it, it, basically the idea of Peace Corps is uh, it sends Americans to uh, developing countries around the world to help with different kinds of projects. You can help teach English. You can help with a clean water project. You can help with agriculture. If you have any specific expertise, when you apply, you should let people know English is one, but there's people, especially like if you're more seasoned professional expertise in business, expertise in project management, uh, they're looking for people with those kinds of skills. And, uh, and they're just looking for people with an interest again in furthering the United States diplomatic mission around the world. And so Peace Corps, the, the flagship program, of course, you might be familiar with already. It's 24 months overseas, uh, plus, plus I believe a few months for an orientation. And there also is another program called Peace Corps Response. Uh, if you're a person with a disability, I have met people who uh, Peace Corps, the flagship program can have a challenging medical clearance process and uh, not not everyone uh, to be transparent may make it uh, but I have met people who have made it through the into the Peace Corps response program and unlike before you can actually now apply for Peace Corps response if you have a specialized skill even not having done the flagship two-year program so that's something to keep in mind and and the great thing about Peace Corps 
compared to all these other awards is, uh, is um, you, you don't have to be in college. This is something you can do at any point in your life. And the Rotary Peace Fellowship, this is actually another one that is opening. Rotary actually, they have a, uh, about three, I believe about three institutions. There's one in Australia, one in the United Kingdom, and one in Japan. And uh, the goal of this is uh, it's a fellowship for people who want to get their master's in, in uh, fields kind of furthering peace, peace around the world. So we actually had a former staff member who got her master's degree in Melbourne, Australia, uh, in in the field in uh do you remember what it was, Monica? It was in it was in a peace field. It, so it and uh, so again, if you're if you're if you if your goal is to um, to uh, have a career where you further peace around the world, um, I believe it was peace and conflict studies. Um, this is this you should definitely look into this Rotary scholarship. Again, it's actually opened. Um, I actually found. We say you should get in contact with your local uh, Rotary club, which uh, you, you definitely that can help. And I also noticed too, uh, as I was just kind of preparing for this presentation, that they actually do have a website uh, where you can actually submit an application online and you can read about all the requirements. So if you're interested in that, feel free to drop us a line and we can help you find that link. And uh, the Japan Exchange and Teaching Jet. Uh, years ago, we actually interviewed another person, a blind guy named uh, Nicholas, his name Nicholas. And uh, he totally blind, he did this program. It's like a teaching assistantship, they teach English. And there's, a, there's even opportunities for sports exchange as well. And it's about uh, probably like a six, nine month program in, in Japan. It's, it's sponsored actually by the Japanese government. And uh, it sounds like kind of, the, kind of again, the idea of furthering understanding between um, the, Jap the Japanese and the rest of the world. And, uh, but uh, sponsored by a different government and a great program. We've heard a lot of good things about it. So if you're interested in getting some experience as an English teaching assistant, uh, you should consider doing this. And I, I believe too, they, they actually had are, are um, there aren't overly strict requirements as far as uh, having your certification to teach English. Um, you, you have to be interested though. And, uh, and certainly any sort of volunteer experience can help. And uh, application opens in September and comes due in November. So the Christensen Grant Inner Exchange, you know, maybe you've got your own kind of program that you want to do. That this is kind of an interesting grant uh, because it essentially is money. Uh, you have to be quite young, I believe. The cutoff age is like around thirty, uh, but it's essentially you you figure out a, a, a community project that you want to do abroad. And you you make the, make a proposal, and uh, and you essentially they, they give you some money and you, you go and do it. Uh, and so, definitely one of those things. If you're if you're kind of square peg trying to fit into a round hole, and you, this is one of those where you can you can uh, kind of come up with your own idea. We actually featured a woman named Sheila Sheila Shu a while back, and you can find her story on our website. She also presented on a podcast with us, and uh, she actually did the Christians and Grant. So you can go to our website and learn about what that involved. And uh, did we have a question? Um, <clears throat> just from Patricia um, asking about which scholarship um, program, uh, if, if it was a scholarship or a research experience. So I was just asking which program she was referencing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you can um, carry on. Yeah, you know, and great. And I'll uh, when she gets uh, when she responds, we can go ahead and answer that. Uh, and so, yeah, and this one again, it's it's a rolling application cycle. The Christensen grant is a rolling cycle, so you you essentially apply when you're ready, when you've got a plan. And uh, one of this this program also keep in mind, along with the Fulbright, you have to have connections in the host country. So, again, talking to previous fellows, but also in the case of the Christensen uh, and also the Fulbright, even in, uh, in certain cases, uh, talking to people in the host country, uh, faculty, and uh, people who can vouch for you and the project that you want to do. So the, the Thomas J. Watson, uh, the uh, Thomas J. Watson Fellowship from the Watson Foundation, up to $36,000. Uh, so uh, 
the idea essentially again you should go read this this website it's just uh, I feel like the slide really doesn't doesn't do it justice it's essentially up to uh, up to thirty six thousand dollars for a year abroad uh, and essentially it's for somebody a younger person there is an age cutoff and the idea is it's sort of like a gap year when I'm, when I'm reading about this it Uh, it was it, it was likely the Fulbright. Um, Patricia is saying it was one of the ones we were discussing before, and she's asking about um, programs for scholarly research. And uh, it, it was likely the Fulbright. The Fulbright has a student program, which is that, that is to get a master's degree or a PhD. Uh, and it also there's also the Fulbright Scholar uh, program, and for that one, that is for faculty at universities who are um, looking to do research in, in another country. Actually, in Monica, doesn't the Fulbright Student Award also sponsor research, like if you're a PhD student and you have a, a plan to do research for a year abroad? Um, say it again, sorry. Doesn't, doesn't the Fulbright Student Award also sponsor research, like if you're a PhD student at University of Oregon and you have an idea to do a year-long research project overseas? Um, mm -hmm. in, for graduate students, yep, yes, yes it is. It does too. So it's the scholar Fulbright Scholar Award is actually for you, university faculty. Uh, but the student award, in addition to earning a degree like a master's or a PhD, it can also be utilized for research. So, and uh, so yeah, the Watson Fellowship. It's 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 a really it's it's essentially if you got you got a plan you you uh, you. Uh, it's, it sounded, honestly, it sounded really vague. I feel like this is definitely one where you'd want to talk to different fellows. We actually do, I, we do, we actually, I believe, feature one person on our website who did this award. So uh, take a look at that. And I, I would also go to their website and read stories about what people do, the different things that people do with this, with this award, because uh, there, it, it sounds like it's very unstructured and, and uh, you, you just you just kind of you have it's for people with imagination and so if, if you've got an idea of you want to spend a gap year you just finished grad school you just finished undergrad and you've got something that you want to do overseas then uh, you should look into this award because it's it's it's, it's a it's, it sounds like a really great opportunity for somebody looking to kind of tailor their own program and uh, Uh, summer research experience. Mm. So we've got a question about whether the Fulbright applies to summer research experience uh, in the case of undergrad. And I, Monica, do you know the answer to that? I'm, I'm not sure that it, it seems like Fulbright is more, it seems like Fulbright tends to favor graduate students. Uh, my sense of it is that when you apply for the Fulbright, it's uh, you have to have a BA degree and whether you're doing like a, a, an English teaching assistantship or uh, whether you're doing a student award, uh, which is to sponsor master's degrees and above, uh, you have to have already finished your BA. So um, you probably need to consult with your university uh, to see if they have any sort of sponsorships or opportunities. Uh, what do you think, Monica? Yeah, the summer research at an undergraduate level, I'm not sure which programs that you've focused on would um, capture that. Um, yeah, maybe we can follow up with her um, with an email at different resources afterwards. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and follow up uh, afterwards. If anybody else has any questions too, um, it sounds like there's not any other questions, but you're always welcome. Great, Patricia. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to reach out to us, clearinghouse at myusa.org, M-I-U-S-A.org. And uh, that it would be happy to answer your questions. Um, please note, just kind of as a transparency, we can, we can help a little bit with scholarships. It's not our specialty. Um, so, um, you might find us also referring you to other uh, sources as well, but we can definitely help you do some searching and uh, and also definitely would encourage you to take a look at websites like uh, Profello. Uh, the other thing to encourage people to do is to uh, look at scholarship search websites like uh, FastWeb. You know, I'd say probably one of the biggest challenges when somebody emails us and says, I'm looking for a scholarship, you know, what do you recommend for me is there's probably uh, 
so many scholarships out there since scholarships are offered by foundations and organizations that are looking to advance a mission that goes beyond sponsoring the person, you know, beyond paying for your study abroad or paying for your research. Um, you end up getting a lot of awards that are for very specific purposes, either that are very program specific, very topic specific, very um, identity specific. And there's a lot of things about you when, when you reach out to us that we don't know. Uh, then you go to a website like FastWeb and, and they can just come up with, you know, a million different scholarships for, you know, a student of color looking to um, study clean water systems in Kenya. You know, I mean, there's there's three things right there. People of color, people going to um, underrepresented countries or countries in Africa, people looking to uh, learn about development and also people in STEM. So there's there's like five or so different interest areas there that a foundation might think of. Uh, and and so that's why um, it's so challenging uh, to come up with do like scholarship specific advice. Um, and it's, but yeah, we'd be happy to do our best. And also if you have any other questions about uh, how you might do it with a disability, how you might uh, answer disability questions, you know, when you're in the interview, um, chances are, if they don't ask you, how are you going to uh, handle your, uh, how are you going to get around your local community when you're volunteering on Peace Corps and you're totally blind, they might still be thinking about it. Uh, and we'd be happy to talk to you about strategies for approaching that. And also uh, after acceptance strategies for um, requesting reasonable accommodations and um, and kind of just navigating the challenges of, of uh, international exchange with a disability. So uh, thank you so much, everybody. We really appreciate your interest in uh, this webinar in international exchange, and we hope that uh, we will keep in touch. Have a great week. Yeah.